Well, we are in session 20 of 24 uh, sessions reviewing the Gospel of Matthew, and we're on chapter 26, which includes the Last Seder, or the Lord's Supper, as many people would call it. And uh, the whole section we're in, of course, is the second of two units, which focuses on the Judean ministry in the final week. The first half of, of Matthew focuses on the Galilean ministry, but from chapters 19 to 28, we're in the second unit, and we're in the final week, which started with the triumphal entry in chapter 21 and climaxes in the resurrection in chapter 28. And uh, we're going to do, look at these in parallel with Mark 11 through 16, covering the same material, Luke 19 to 24, where he covers the same material, and John, which he devotes half of his entire gospel to this one week of activities, which is another way of indicating how important, how critical, how crucial, and how rewarding this particular segment of Scripture will prove to be. And uh, last time, we reviewed chapter 25, some teachings in anticipation of the big climax, which included three topics, the ten virgins, the ten talents, and the sheep and goat judgment. And uh, the sheep and goat judgment being the judgment of the nations or the Gentiles. Not to be confused, that's at the beginning of the setting up of the kingdom. A thousand years later, the great white throne judgment will be the final climax. The Bema Seat of Christ is where the believers get their rewards, and we visualize that. Uh, not all scholars would agree, but we visualize that as occurring in heaven during the first half of that tribulation period. In other words, uh, after the rapture, but before the uh, great tribulation, all of that going on. And uh, the great white throne judgment, of course, is the final judgment at the end of the millennium, uh, subject of a whole other teaching. Then. So the sheep and goat judgment we looked at last time. Now we're going into chapter 26 of Matthew. And he will be at Bethany for the first 16 verses, and that'll contrast worship versus waste, interestingly enough. Then we're going to be in the upper room with the number of events there. We're going to see the contrast between faithfulness and betrayal. And then we'll be in Gethsemane from chapters 31 through 56, I mean verses 31 to 56. And there will be contrasting submission versus resistance. That won't be in this session. That will be in the session after next for reasons I'll explain shortly. In Matthew 26, we have him, of course, predicting his suffering and death in the first five verses, his anointing at Bethany in the next eight verses, the betrayal of Judas being plotted in verses 14, 15, and 16, the Passover meal. Many people don't realize it. That's a, it was a Passover meal for some very specific reasons. And that's in that meal, he institutes something new that we call the Lord's Supper or communion. Koinonia is the actual Greek term. And uh, from there, they, of course, go to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's arrested and accused and so forth, and Peter goes through his denial and so on. We're only going to take the first five of those eight elements of this chapter because we want to supplement it with some perspectives from some of the other Gospels on just, on just that part of it before we go further. In session 20, which, we'll, uh, which uh, we're in, we'll deal with Matthew 26, first 35 verses, Mark 14, first 32 verses, Luke 22, first 39 verses. In the session following, we're going to set Matthew on the shelf for a moment, for one session, and we're going to focus on the upper room discourse in John, chapters 13 through 17, one of the most phenomenal passages in the Bible. It's, it, it, uh, you, see, you get a glimpse of the intimacy between the Son and the Father in this, this remarkable uh, discourse. And uh, so we're gonna, we're, we don't want to crowd this is all too important. We're going to focus a, a session on just that before going on then to Gethsemane, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. So Matthew 26, verse 1, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. He has said this again and again and again, and the guys don't get it. The gals did. A couple of the gals apparently did. The guys didn't. It, it went by them. 
just finished these teachings that we just went through, and now he's, he's announced that in two days there's the Feast of the Passover. Very important to understand God's precision. It's, they say that a Jew's catechism is his calendar. You really, even as Christians, need to do some homework and understand the Jewish calendar because there's profound lessons in there for you and I as Christian believers that we lose if we separate ourselves from, our, in effect, our Jewish roots. And Passover is, the, is a very, very surprisingly fundamental item in God's calendar. And uh, it's going to be interesting to realize how much of this is being orchestrated in a manner that was planned before the world was created, before the foundation of the world. In any case, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. And uh, I wonder what a high priest is doing in a palace in the first place, but I'll leave that one alone. And consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. These are the leaders. This is the leadership of the nation. This is the leadership that is out to throttle eliminate, uh, exterminate this uh, nuisance to them. But I want you to notice a verse, verse 5, that most people don't realize. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. They did not plan to take Jesus on this holiday for lots of reasons. There are over a million visitors to Jerusalem because it's one of three feasts, Deuteronomy 16, 16 specifies three feasts that were compulsory for every able-bodied Jew to make. And uh, the Passover period is one of them. So they're crowded with tourists. This is the high season of, uh, there's one of these in the spring and there's a season like this in the fall. And this is the spring season. Furthermore, they're under the thumb of Rome. And Rome almost didn't care what you did as long as you did it orderly. What Rome was concerned about was insurrection. Their report card got measured back in Rome by how smoothly things were, how much in control they were. And so they didn't want to have an uproar. Uh, they, not only would they have a problem with their people, they'd also have a huge problem with the Roman leadership. So the plan was to do it quietly after the crowds had left to get them through subtly and knock this off quickly and quietly and never be missed. That was the concept. And as you'll see, it went quite differently. See, in Deuteronomy 16, 16, three times in a year shall thy males appear before the Lord thy God in a, the place which he shall choose in the feast of the unleavened bread, the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty, and it goes on with instructions. The feast of unleavened bread is an eight-day period which embraces three feasts, actually. The feast of Passover itself, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the day following, and the Feast of first fruits, which is the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Passover is any day of the week, depending on how the calendar works, but after it will be a Shabbat, and the next day would be a Sunday morning. And that's when the Feast of first fruits is. And so that's very interesting to realize that's all anticipatory of the Christian era. And the more you study the calendar, the more profound it becomes, but I'll leave it at that for this, this pass-through. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, now, Bethany is on the Mount of Olives on the uh, east side and on the slightly south, and uh, it was a place that was friendly and quiet. He's among friends. This is his primary hangout when he's in the Jerusalem area. The city was tense, crowded, and full of his enemies. Uh, This was a refuge for him in the house of Simon the leper. He obviously is not a leper. He wouldn't be in the house. He was obviously a healed leper, very likely one that Jesus healed, okay? There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? And for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. We'll learn from the other Gospels that it was, 
the, the instigator of this trouble was Judas, because Judas was the treasurer. And so he was frustrated because this, this ointment amounts to about a year's salary. This was very expensive stuff, and this gal obviously had spent her savings or whatever to, to provide this. And uh, Judas, we know from the other accounts, was the one that stirred up the, the commotion among the disciples, saying that this is a waste that could have been sold and given to the poor. I'm sure if it had been, the poor would never have seen it, but uh, the bagman would have had his piece of the action there. So that's uh, so. so uh, in any case, there are at least 17 people at this dinner, by the way. Uh, Simon, the owner, of course, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, the three, and Jesus and the 12 disciples. And uh, Lazarus had been raised a few weeks before. In fact, that's circulating among all the tourists. Really, they've all heard about Lazarus, a big deal. And uh, in John 12, you'll also learn that the, the plot to kill Lazarus was also afoot by the scribes and Pharisees. Now, this ointment was obviously a, a, a myrrh-based ointment. And you may recall that at his birth, we have the three gifts, gold, myrrh, and frankincense. Those aren't the only gifts. Those are the only three that are mentioned. And, uh, but they're mentioned because they're prophetic. Gold speaks of his deity. Frankincense speaks of the priesthood. It's mixed in the showbread by the priests and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a material that has priesthood implications. And myrrh, when crushed, is an ointment for burial. And that's apparently a derivative of what she had in this alabaster box. And uh, the reason these three gifts are mentioned at his birth is they're prophetic. Speaking of prophet, priest, and king. And uh, uh, each, each in their order. And so... Uh, it's very possible that this gal connected that, understood that. In any case, she, she clearly knew he was going to be killed. He's a, she's anointing him for burial. There's a subtlety to this that is also often missed. She also may have been savvy enough to realize that he was going to raise in three days so his body would never see corruption, which is one of the reasons you embalm. So she doesn't need to be dealt with after his death, he's being anointed beforehand. And uh, even that, can, one can infer a resurrection motif there. But moving on. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you. But me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. So there's the underscore. This isn't a contrived interpretation. Jesus explains it. Okay? I think that's pretty straightforward. Now, um, an incredible act of love and devotion by this gal, which was obviously not of means, and yet she's really, she's really uh, uh, done a good work here. It's interesting how Mary... Martha's sister is always misunderstood. Her sister Martha misunderstood her when Mary sat at Jesus' feet to hear him teach the word back in Luke chapter 10. Judas and the other disciples misunderstood her when she anointed Jesus here in this passage that we just looked at. Her friends and neighbors misunderstood her when she came out of the house to meet Jesus after Lazarus had been buried, if you recall that back in John 11. It's interesting, she appears three times, and each time she's misunderstood. When we give Jesus Christ first place in our lives, we need to expect that we will be misunderstood and criticized by those who claim to follow him. Not just the unbelievers. Don't be surprised that you may be criticized by fellow believers. I'll put that in quotation marks. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, where, Wheresoever this gospel be, shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Wow. That's pretty cool. And that remark is in each of the gospel accounts, as we'll see. Meanwhile, the, she, the scene now shifts. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for thirty 
pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Okay? You'll learn as we go here, it was not the plan to take him that night. But Jesus forced him to. And that's very interesting because he's following a tight agenda. Um, it's interesting. We could go on and on about Judas. He was the only one of the 12 that was not a Galilean. He's a Judean. And uh, the 30 piece of silver happens to be the price of a slave to be redeemed. And uh, there are 30 silver coins. We really don't know how much that is. That 30 piece of silver was the price of a slave, and yet uh, was that the whole deal or not? There's, there's discussions about that issue too. Back in Zechariah, some five centuries earlier, Zechariah records uh, in chapter 11, verse 12, I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they wait for my price, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Strange prophecy. But we'll learn when we get to Matthew 27 that Judas will try to give the money back and they won't take it. He throws it on the floor and goes out and hangs himself. And the priests see the cash there. They can't put it in the treasury. It's against the law. It's blood money. But they have good accountants on staff and so they, <laughs> they can use it to prepay anticipated expenses. And one of the burdens the temple had is when someone died in their precincts that wasn't covered by a near relative, the temple had to deal with the funeral costs and take care of a stranger that might have passed away for some reason. And so they, uh, there was a bargain piece of ground available from a potter that they could take the silver and buy the field so they could, uh, t to cover the expenses they know they're going to have. Every year there's a few that die and they have to deal with that. So it's a way of prepaying expenses. Well, what's interesting is they go and do that but by buying that field, who ends up with the money? The guy that owned the field, a potter, the potter's field. And it's all embodied here, this little prophecy. The 30 pieces of silver, it ends up in the potter's hands. And where does the transaction take place? In the temple, in the house of the Lord. All there, five centuries before the fact. I think that's kind of fun. Passover. How glibly we use that phrase. We all associate Passover as that ceremony, that feast day, that commemorates their flight from Egypt when the death angel passed over the homes that had the blood on the door posts. The Egyptian Passover. On the 14th of Nisan, the 14th day of, the, uh, of that month. It's interesting that if you go to the time of Abraham and he's told to offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, and as they're going up the hill, Isaac says to Abraham, uh, here's the fire of the wood, where's the lamb? And Abraham says, God will provide himself a lamb. And whenever I read that, I always think, well, he's just giving the kid a stall until we get up on the hill. No, God will provide who? Himself, a lamb. Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy. That's why he names the place, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. He may not have realized that 2,000 years later on that exact spot, another father would offer his son as an offering for sin. I believe Abraham was doing this on a place called Golgotha. There's a Jewish tradition that he did it where the temple stands, but that's just a Jewish tradition without, in my opinion, adequate support. But be that as it may. It's interesting that John the Baptist, when he introduces Jesus for the first time, he does it twice. He says, Behold the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. That's a Passover label. When Jesus is first introduced publicly by his forerunner, he's called a Passover lamb, the, the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. He says that in verse 29 and also verse 36 of the first chapter. Passover is the identity of Jesus Christ, and Paul uses that same thing in his epistles, speaking of Jesus as our Passover. There are all kinds. We could do a whole evening study on the subtle symbols that are involved with Passover, the fact that they go through the house and get rid of the leaven. Leaven is a type of sin. Why is it a type of sin? Because it corrupts by puffing up. Pride is the source of sin. The fact that not a bone was to be broken. A Roman centurion would fulfill that unknowingly by violating his orders a couple of chapters from now. 
And it goes on and on and on. We could go on and make long lists of the symbolisms that uh, Passover is prophetic of the events that we're going to behold here in this and the next couple of chapters. The timing may, may be a surprise to you that the Passover is being offered three days before he leaves the tomb, and he will leave the tomb on the anniversary of Noah's new beginning when he leaves the ark on Mount Ararat in Genesis 8 verse 4. On the 17th day of the seventh month, they leave the ark. The seventh month in Genesis was the seventh month from Tishri, which is Nizon. In Exodus 12, God has them revise their calendar. They have two calendars. They have the original Genesis calendar, of course, like the Rosh Hashanah as being in the fall. They have Nisan in the spring. And the 14th of Nisan is when Passover was ordained, and it was ordained so that Jesus, our new beginning in Christ, would be on the anniversary of the world's new beginning under Noah. So it's, it's, it, when you start getting into that, it's just astonishing. So Matthew verse 17, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? Feast of Unleavened Bread is an eight-day celebration, all that, but I won't get into all that here. There's a big preparation. Not, uh, they have to get a lamb. It has to be uh, approved by the, at the temple, and it has to be slaughtered properly, and so forth. So there's a lot of preparations. He said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. We will, as we get, see the different accounts of this, you'll get the feeling this has all been prearranged. And uh, there's, there's some that believe that it was the father of John Mark that provided the home. He did come from a wealthy family. Uh, who knows? But in any case, there is some prearrangement going on here, and they're following through. Now when even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. That must have shook the, the table. And they were exceedingly sorrowful and began to every one of them say unto him, Lord, is it I? He answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Judas was on his left and John was on his right. And the act, strangely enough, the one on the left was a place of honor. And that's where Judas was sitting, sharing the same sop. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He doesn't call him Lord. He calls him Rabbi. Interesting. Is it I? He said unto them, Thou hast said. Or as we might say it, you said it. Thou hast said is ambiguous in the, in, in the old King. We don't pick up on that. But it's, if we were writing in the modern writing, said, you said it. You're right. Now, you need to get the picture here. Judas was not prepared because this is Passover. This is the big uh, holiday of the year. This was not the time that the chief priests or whatever had planned to take this on. Jesus now announced that he's going to be betrayed, and he also indicates by whom. What he in effect has done, he said to Judas, you got a fish or cut bait. He forces him, if you're going to do it, you got to do it now. You can't do it tomorrow or the next day because the word will be out. You know, you're, you're, he's, Jesus himself is forcing the issue. Not forcing him to do it, but forcing the timing. If you're going to do it, as we would say it, you got to fish or cut bait or the cat's out of the bag or however you want to put it. And uh, now, there is a big debate among many who do not understand this problem of the time dimension. The time dimension is a physical dimension. And this whole debate that has gone on for many thousands of years about fate versus free will, are things predestined? Are they predicted? That means they're predestined. Or do we really have free choice? Let's take Judas as the classic example. It was predicted that he would do this. Did he have the choice to do this? Both are true. 
From the divine point of view, and that's a point of view from outside the dimensionality of time, not limited by the constraints of mass, acceleration, or gravity, any of those things. It therefore is free of time, outside time. Judas' treachery was predicted in Scripture, and it was included in the plan of God. God was not surprised. He knew he would. And from that, you and I might erroneously jump to the conclusion that it, it, he had no choice. Not true. Not true. From the, see, we see it from the human point of view from being within that time domain. Judas was guilty of a base crime and was completely responsible for what he did. The fact that God is outside time and can see what choice he was going to make doesn't relieve him of the fact that he made the choice. It's only a paradox when you try to view it from within the time domain. One of the techniques of paradox uh, resolution that you get into if you get into these things is to get outside the box, stand outside the time dimension. It's not a paradox at all. And this is one of the classic cases of this, this kind of thing. And uh, so we have a briefing package called The Sovereignty of Man, which deals with the predicament every one of us has. We have responsibility. We have so there's the sovereignty of God, of course. There's also the sovereignty of man. One of the most staggering, terrifying gifts that he's given us is our sovereignty, our ability to choose. Knowing that by choosing, we'll get ourselves into trouble, that nothing less than the death of God will avail to get us out of that trouble. So who's in control? But the real point is, who's in control? Judas isn't. Who's calling the shots? Jesus Christ. And you'll discover that happens at every step of the way. The guy that's actually, in effect, in charge is our Lord. Back in chapter 26, verse 5, they're not going to do it on a feast day. They're going to end up doing it on a feast day. In fact, the biggest feast of all. How ironic that the biggest crime ever perpetrated on the planet Earth was done on their most holy day. Kind of interesting. It's one of three days that were compulsory, Deuteronomy 16. So Judas now had a fish or cut bait, as I would express it. And he had a lot to get made. He had to get with a high priest to make their arrangements. They couldn't just run up to Pilate. They'd have to schedule a, 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 an audience with him in the morning. That took some pull and some maneuvering. They had to muster the troops. And as on it goes. So Judas, you know, Jesus says, to do, do Judas, what you do, do quickly. Get on with it, in other words. And as they were eating, and I believe, uh, not all scholars agree on all the details, but I do believe Judas left before the Lord's Supper. I do not think he took the Lord's Supper, but I may stand to be corrected. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. This is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. For him to say, this is my body, is not an unusual idiom for them to use because it's Passover. They speak of the body of the Lamb. And so that, but this is, he's saying, this is my body. The emphasis is on the my. And uh, there's all the big debate, is this grape juice or wine? This is too early in the season for unfermented grapes, uh, candidly. And uh, so, but this whole event, we, don't, we can spend all evening talking about the Lord's Supper. But it's important to understand it looks ahead to Christ's return. That's really the intent of this. We will observe this ceremony until he comes. That's really, it's, 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 it's to fill this gap. The bread and wine that are introduced here have a deep history in the scripture. When Abram comes back from his victory in the, in the battle of the nine kings, he encounters this strange character called Melchizedek, which administers to him bread and wine. Interesting. In Genesis 14. When Joseph has, encounters these guys in prison, Again, we have a three-day interval involving both a wine steward and a, and a baker. The wine steward, uh, who is reinstated after three days, as Joseph predicted by interpreting his dream for him, and the baker, same thing, three days, but he gets hung. And, and he was hoping that they would remember him, and years go by, he spends, what, what is it, 12 or 13 years in prison, hoping to get uh, uh, taken care of. Jesus uses a whole, John 6, most of that chapter is on the bread of life. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread. 
and the wine at Cana in, uh, in uh, John 2 and so forth. In Exodus 6, we discover a passage that has its roots, that the Passover has its roots in. Um, in Exodus 6, verse 6, says, Where, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, this is God talking to Moses, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rid you out of their bondage, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, I will take you to me for a people. And I'll be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. These were the instructions, the early instructions. The Passover occurs in chapter 12 of Exodus. This is chapter 6 as part of the preparatory passages. But I want you to notice here, in the Passover observance in, in, among Jews today, there are four cups of the Passover. After four, I will. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rid you out of their, uh, their bondage or deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and I will take you to me. From these four commands come the four cups of the Passover. The cup of the bringing out, the cup of the delivery, the cup of the redemption or blessing, and the cup of the taking out. So these classic Jewish cups have labels. What's fascinating to realize is Jesus only goes to cup number three. He administers the Lord's Supper, as we call it, with the cup of redemption, or, or Paul, what Paul calls the cup of blessing. He does not touch the fourth cup. In fact, he's going to make a statement that he's not going to touch the fruit of the vine until we're all together with him in heaven. Interesting. He's taking a Nazarite vow in a sense. So... Uh, the cup of blessing is in, uh, that Paul talks about is, the, is cup number three. He, Jesus says, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You realize it's the day that we're going to hoist a glass with our Lord? That's wild. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And most scholars believe that they sang the Hallel Psalms. Now, there's several groups of psalms called the Hallel Psalms. They typically mean Psalm 115 to 118. The Egyptian Hallel is 113 to 118, a slightly different grouping. There's the Great Hallel, which is 118 to 136, which also includes 119, which is a huge thing. But the, the Hallel Psalms are the ones that most scholars presume they sang. And when you read, I encourage you to read those psalms in the context that you're with the disciples, you're walking from the upper room through the city to get to Gethsemane, the base of the Mount of Olives. And so there's some things that are going to go on along the way. We're at verse 30 here. I suspect they got to Gethsemane about verse 36, as I recall. But they, he's, as they're walking, they're singing a song, and as they're walking... Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Now he's telling them all this, but it's clear they had no grasp of what on earth he's talking about. They remember later what he said, but they obviously are a bewildered group of guys. But Jesus quoting here from Zechariah 13, 7, where Zechariah quotes, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts, Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Now when Jesus says that, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Boy, that's dangerous. Do you realize that we're all going to stumble? And when we stumble, it'll be in our strong suit, not our weak suit. As the pride is the root of that. Here's Peter. He's brave Peter. And yet he's the one that's going to cower and deny the Lord three times before the cock crows that morning. Yet will I never be offended. And Jesus said, I'm verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times. Peter said, and though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. And likewise said, also said all the disciples. Though they're all murmuring the same thing, not us. You know, we're going to stick with you. 
Yeah, we'll see. So let's take a look at what Mark says in Mark 14, just to pick up his perspective of the same section. After two days of the Feast of the Passover on unleavened bread, the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death, but said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people, same as Matthew recorded. And being Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, spike card, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. There's a record in Luke, I think it is, where she pours it on his feet. She actually did both, but they're emphasizing different aspects. And there were some of that had indignation within themselves, said, why was this waste of ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. There it is, a year's worth of salary. And had been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble you her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor always with you. And, whosoever ye, and wheresoever ye will may do them good, but me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, whosoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. So this is Mark's account, obviously paralleling Matthew's, uh, Mark being the uh, secretary for Peter, really. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray him unto them, and when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. So these are parallels so far. And the first day of the unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said to him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sent forth two of his disciples, I think it was Peter and John, by the way, and uh, saith unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall ye meet a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. That's a little weird. Men didn't do that. That's a woman's job. So that's obviously a sign of recognition. And, by, and some scholars suspect that it was John Mark's father that set this all up for some reasons that they conjecture. And wheresoever he, sh he shall go in, say ye to the goodman of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared there, make ready for us. So it's obviously, there's some prearrangements here. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. This is non-trivial. It's a crowded city, many, many tourists. It's hard to find a spot that would be findable anyway, let alone have the security they really need to have some privacy for their um, uh, observation here. In the evening, uh, he cometh with the twelve, and as he sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and said him, one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? He answered and said to them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him, but woe unto the, that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had not been born. So, so far, they're very, very parallel. There is a, a prophet, uh, Psalm 41.9 speaks of a prediction of Judas, what's regarded by most scholars, prediction of Judas. It's actually... It, it, it arises from a case of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was the, the old man that uh, when Absalom revolted against David, Ahithophel deserted David and espoused the cause of Absalom. A shocking disloyalty. <coughs> Absalom's leading the revolt and this grand old man is, is advising Absalom. David sent his old friend, Hushai, back to Absalom in order that he might counteract the counsel of Ahithophel. All in 2 Samuel. Now, Ahithophel finally realized it was a lost cause. The end was so far gained that Ahithophel saw that he had no longer any influence, and accordingly he at once left the camp of Absalom, returned to Gilo, his native place, where after arranging his worldly affairs, he hanged himself and was buried in the sepulcher of his fathers. And so this is, in effect, he is a type of Judas. There's a, a psalm that relates to this that is also applied to Judas. That's where Psalm 41.9 uh, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted has lifted up his heel against me, is what Psalm 41 9 says. There's something about Ahithophel that most people don't realize, and I'll just share with you this, it's kind of interesting. Why would this old man turn against King David and betray him? And the answer is buried in the genealogies. It turns out, if you do your homework, you'll discover that Ahithophel happens to be Bathsheba's grandfather. He never forgave. David, for what he did, in effect, to his granddaughter, apparently. Anyway, Psalm 41.9 is often quoted as a, a prophecy of Judas, and it is, but by type, if you will. Let's move on. As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it, break it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, gave it to them. They all drank of it. 
And he said to them, this is, the, is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out in the Mount of Olives. So Mark <clears throat> is again very, very uh, essentially uh, the same as the Matthew account. And he goes on, he says, saith unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter said to him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. He said, Verily I say unto you, This day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. And they came to a place which was named in Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I pray, and we'll pick up that in a subsequent session. Let's take a quick snapshot of Luke because we'll pick up some other subtleties there. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread do not, which is called the Passover. The chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. They feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being the number of the twelve. Very interesting point because Satan enters into Judas here early. Judas will later go before the scribes and Pharisees trying to give the money back and say, I've betrayed innocent blood. I'm always fascinated with that remark because Satan's in Judas and it's Satan's own words declaring Christ innocent. I think that's kind of interesting. And he went his way and he communed with the chief priests and how he might betray them unto him. And again, it wasn't planned to do this night. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. He sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare us the Passover. You meet. These are the two guys. Peter and John are the two insiders setting up the upper room thing. Where wilt thou that we prepared? He said unto them, behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. You shall say unto the good men of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. So far, so good. Pretty much in parallel. The preparations are non-trivial. They include an approved lamb uh, that was uh, roasted, Appropriate wine, that was a specific kind, unleavened bread, and bitter herbs. And uh, all, all in, in designed to commemorate their bondage in Egypt. He said to them, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Now Luke's account would imply that Judas is among the communion. And there's some debates about that. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was a, also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. So they're murmuring about how they're sitting around the table. They're not the first time that this has taken on. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. And for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Ye, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. How interesting it is that those 12 are directed to the 12 tribes of Israel. Another apostle will emerge that will be the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul. In Acts chapter 1, because Judas is gone, they draw lots to replace him with a 12th guy, Matthias. 
And a lot of people figure that was a mistake. It should have been Paul. No, they're missing the point. Those 12 are to Israel. Paul was to the Gentiles. That was, that was, it was introduced by, in Acts 10 by Peter, um, but it was, the, the, it was acknowledged by both Peter and Paul that Paul wanted to be minister to the Jews, his own brethren. But um, he recognized he was called to minister to the Gentiles. There are distinctions you want to be sensitive to as you go. But anyway, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. The word you there in the language is in the plural. It isn't Peter alone that Satan desires. It's all of them. We often read this in the English and assume that this is a special prayer on behalf of Peter, and it certainly was, don't misunderstand me, but it doesn't, it's not restricted to him. The, the, uh, the, uh, Satan desired to have all of them, and that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. He's not talking, he's already a saved man. It's not his salvation that's in jeopardy, it is his discipleship. We're going to see in another passage after the resurrection. Go tell the disciples and Peter. In other words, that, that's, that, that distinction you want to be sensitive to. Strengthen the brethren. He said to them, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both to prison and to death. He said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. He said to them, when I sent you without purse or script or shoes, lacked you anything? They said, nothing. He said unto them, when I sent you without purse, script, and shoes, lacked ye anything? He said, nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Wow. That's an interesting verse. Things are going to get rough. And self-defense is an issue to think through. Self-reliance is certainly an issue, and self-defense is part of that. So you can pray that one through. For I say unto you that, th that this that is written must be yet be accomplished in me, and it was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. He said, it's enough. He came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. Enough already, huh? Okay, we have another passage, but I've, I'll, I'll postpone that for a separate session next time that I think you'll find remarkably rewarding, where we'll go through John 13 to 18, just specifically, just that, because um, it fills in an extensive discourse that Jesus presented the disciples, and it's recorded by one who is present, John himself. Um, Luke is picking up editorially from, you know, later from these guys, but John was present. And there's a very, very revealing number of insights. He'll talk about the rapture, and he'll talk about all kinds of things that will surprise you. And uh, in preparation of next time, I have a test question for you. It'll be on the final exam. Name someone that God loves and did not pray for. So we'll go next time, we'll go to the Upper Room Discourse, John 13 and 17, which some people would call the job description of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is leaving, he's leaving the description, uh, a job description of the one that's going to take, uh, to step in on his behalf. That's next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.